And next, we're going to talk a little about medical marijuana. Thank you, Representative Barnes. Uh, I really appreciate being here. My name is Lyndall Fraker, and I also uh, actually work out of the Department of Health and Senior Services, so these folks are my colleagues, too. Uh, but I am the director of the medical marijuana section for regulation for the state of Missouri. Um, just a little bit of background, I served eight years in the Missouri House, just completed uh, my last term last year, so I got to serve one term with Representative Barnes. Uh, it was an honor and privilege to do that. He's very well respected in the, in the House, and you're lucky to have him here as your representative. I uh, live down in Marshfield, down by Springfield, out on I-44, uh, southwest Missouri. And prior to my time in the House, I uh, was county commissioner of Webster County. And I'm a building contractor, and I also worked for 17 years with Walmart stores, my last seven as the store manager of my hometown there in Marshfield. So, have a little bit of a varied background. Uh, uh, some might wonder why in the world I'm the director of medical marijuana. Well, <laughs> no one wonders that any more than me. <laughs> so, but when the governor's office called me and uh, I was asked to take this task on, I think one reason is because uh, I don't have a dog in the hunt, so to speak. We uh, looked, at, looked at this program very objectively. It was passed by an overwhelming margin, 65% majority back on November the 6th. Uh, it was put on the ballot by referendum, which means the people put it on the ballot. And it was one of three initiatives that were on there, and it, and it was the one that, that won the, the biggest, the largest margin. Part of the amendment, uh, it spelled out a lot of different things. One was that it would be a part of the uh, Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. So, that's the department that uh, was tasked to regulate the industry. Um, another thing that I want to always want to tell people is, is that 51% uh, of the ownership of the businesses that will be coming into uh, Missouri to be able to uh, uh, run the programs or have the businesses have to be Missouri residents. So even though there, there will be outside interests come in, experience, and all the various uh, reasons, there has to be a 51% ownership by Missourians, and they have to be residents for a year. Um, so you're going to see, you're really going to see a cultural shift in our state, quite frankly. And uh, but the thing that we have to remember is this is this is a medical marijuana program, medical only. Nothing changes on the illegal side of marijuana. It's only we're just carving out the portion that becomes medical. So there's quite a few specifics, quite a bit of criteria that uh, we have to follow that's in the amendment, which is now in our Constitution. And then we're taking that and working with rules and regulations in order to get the program implemented. So far, we've held five public <coughs> forums across the state. There's been uh, over 700 people attend those forums. We've tried to be very open and transparent. We've tried to listen to the citizens to make sure we get the program up and running in the very best way possible. Uh, we've also engaged with other public agencies, including all the local governments, cities, counties, other state agencies, uh, the law enforcement community we're working very closely with. I've also had individual meetings with all the highway patrol troops around the state and invited in the local sheriffs and police departments so we can all be partners in this endeavor and, and asking for their input as we draft the rules. We've had an awful lot of great comments, a lot of questions about the amendment, the rules, the program structure, and we are trying to respond to those inquiries daily. We're getting a, a lot of calls and a lot of suggestions. Um, amendment two, uh, our goals, fulfill the will of the voters, make sure we meet all the deadlines while protecting the Constitution. And some of those deadlines are pretty tight. We're having to work really hard to be able to do that. Uh, we're learning from other states. There's many, we're the 33rd state now to have some form of legal marijuana. 20 years ago, there was not any. 21 years ago, there wasn't any. And 10 years ago is when the first recreational state came on board, along with the medical states that were on board at the time. We are strictly medical, but we're not recreational here in Missouri. We want to keep our characteristics in mind as we build this Missouri program. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the very best medical program in the nation. And of course, we're going to create a level playing field by enforcing all of the regulatory requirements in a very firm, transparent, and consistent manner. That's our goal. And I guess you might say, we 
we want to create a well-regulated, enforced patient-focused program that safely and effectively provides access to medical marijuana for qualified residents of Missouri in order to meet their medical needs. That's our goal. So Amendment 2, as I mentioned, passed by 65%. The specific dates that uh, were spelled out in there, uh, we'll go over here in just a moment. And we have to make sure that we have all of the initial licenses granted by December 31st of 2019. The amendment calls for some minimum facilities, the licenses that we'll be issuing. It calls for two testing facilities minimum, 60 cultivation facilities, 86 manufacturing facilities, and 192 total dispensaries. Now, on the dispensary section, that's the retail stores, you might say. They have to be distributed around the state by congressional district. So, uh, there's eight congressional districts. That means that 24 dispensaries will be allowed per congressional district. Um, you're in congressional district uh, five here. And I believe, uh, last I checked, you have somewhere around 50, somewhere in the 50s that have pre-filed their application fees in this congressional district. I think you're the largest one. So, uh, obviously there will only be 24 licenses issued, so we've already got the, more than double the applicants. Now when I say pre-filed applications, what, what that is, is in the amendment, the drafters were, you might say, fairly smart about this. They wanted to make sure that citizens that maybe were on the fence or wasn't sure if they were going to vote for it, they didn't want revenue to be an issue. So they didn't want, they, didn't want, they felt like some might, might not, not uh, vote for it if they thought the taxpayers would have to, to pay for it from general funds, fund the program. So they put a, a piece in there about uh, people sending in their pre-application fees, which began on January the 5th, and that money would be used to fund the program. And so as of today, we have over 470 pre-application fees that we've already received since January, and that's for over a total of $3,400,000. Now these fees are non-refundable, and as I mentioned, uh, Earlier, we have about 340 licenses that we had planned to issue if you had the 192 and the 60 and the 86. And we've already received 470 application fees. We think that number may go up to six or 700 possible application fees by the time we get to August. So that's going to be a very contentious part of this program. I mean, there's going to be people not happy that they didn't get a license. And we know that uh, that's the part that's going to, be, going to be a little bit tough for us, but we're going to do our very best. Uh, the amendment also called for a scoring system. Uh, so in other words, uh, there's about 10 categories that we have to look at as they're applying for these licenses. And we'll be breaking that down into uh, a set of uh, score, scoring uh, categories in order to and it'll be a blind scoring system, so we won't even know who those applicants are. We'll strictly be looking at their, their scores. And certain things like a business plan and a site security plan and um, all kinds of factors will go in their experience in the industry, which means probably many of them will have outside partners coming in from out of state because we, didn't, we haven't had any legal industry in Missouri. So uh, the one thing about this program is, is it'll be a Missouri-only program. Nothing can cross state lines, and of course, most of that's dictated because of the federal law that's still out there against uh, marijuana in general. We plan uh, to, to be able to issue medical marijuana cards to patients. And the industry tells us that somewhere between 2 and 3 percent of the state's population possibly could file for a card. That means with 6 million residents in Missouri, we're looking at somewhere between 120,000 and 180,000 potential patient cards that we'll have to work and issue. Um, the other dates that I want to mention that were spelled out in the amendment, uh, the January 5th date is the one that we've already met, receiving the pre-application fees. The next date will be June the 4th, and that's when we have to have all the rules totally completed and published also have to have the application forms for the license facilities and for the patient card uh, applications. Those all have to be completed by June the 4th. The next date is July the 4th, and that's the date we'll begin accepting those patient card applications. And then the following date is August the 3rd, and that's the date we'll begin accepting the license facility applications. So those are the most important dates because they're now in our Constitution. And as I mentioned, 
that you know, we have to have those licensed licenses back to those applicants uh, this by December the 31st. The patient cards, as we get those applications in, we have to turn those back around in 30 days. So let's say you decide that you, uh, you and your doctor, uh, by the way, every patient card, every patient will have to be certified by their by their doctor, and it has to be an MD or a DO. It can't be an RN or a physician's assistant or anything like that. It has to be a medical doctor. Uh, then they will certify that you would qualify based on uh, several categories that is listed in the amendment uh, that you would qualify to be able to get medical marijuana. And then as that certification is turned back in with the application form for the medical card, then we will issue that, that card back to the patient within 30 days. Those cards are good for a year. It's a $25 um, application fee to process. And then uh, at every year it'll be it'll be renewed twenty five dollars a year. Now there's another portion to this program. This is the home grow portion, and this is the portion that says that if you're a medical marijuana patient and you've been certified by your doctor, then you can also apply for a home cultivation card, and this would allow you to be able to grow up to six plants in your home. This card will be a hundred dollar fee. Uh, and it would be in addition to your $25 patient fee. If you aren't able to grow yourself, then there will also be another option, and that would be a caregiver uh, a card that would, we would issue. And the caregiver would be allowed to, to grow three plants for you as a patient, again, with a $100 fee. So those are the options that are available or that will be available come July the 4th for the patient portion. We expect to employ around 50 people in our department, uh, which will be a whole new department for the Department of Health. And these folks will be doing things like compliance, uh, investigating inspectors, um, out in the field, following up with facilities, making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. There will also be people in the office processing these licenses and these cards. As you can imagine, if we have 100 and 50,000 medical marijuana patients that we have to renew their card every year, once a year. You break that down by business days, and we're processing six, seven, eight hundred cards a day is what it's going to take. So you can imagine the staff that that's going to involve. So I think I've touched on most of the rules, or most of the uh, dates in the amendment. As I mentioned, we're working on the rules right now. We, we are releasing rough drafts of those as we get them done. And we've sent the first two parts out. The patient caregiver part is out there on our website. And then the facility license portion is out there on the website. So uh, there's quite a bit of information already out there that you can follow up and review. Uh, and then uh, we'll have more, as we continue to update, we'll have more and more of those. Um, I would like to mention our website. Uh, this is the most important part, probably. And if you go to... Uh, health.mo.gov slash safety slash medical marijuana, you'll be able to pull up our section. And again, there, there'll be a lot of information there. The actual amendment, Amendment 2, that we all voted on back in November, it's there. And it's about 13 pages long. And there's a lot of information there also. So with that, I think I'll take any questions. I'm sorry if I went over a little bit. But, uh, they need the website again. You bet. You bet. You went a little too fast. I'm sorry. It's uh, health.mo.gov. That's the general uh, health, uh, Department of Health website. And then slash safety slash medical marijuana. Yes, ma'am. With the application, you mentioned a point system. Uh -huh. And determining, of course, it's going to be very uh, competitive. But what kind of transparency are you, is your department going to have because these licenses are going to be very competitive? He got one, he got one, he got one, you didn't. How are we going to know if there's like 12 people who all got the same score? Who's going to determine you get a license and you don't? That's what I'd like to know. Sure. I don't have an answer for that yet because we're still working on that okay. part. But that's a good question. And that's, again, as I mentioned, that's going to be the most contentious part. So, but we're trying to work through that. We've got attorneys working on it. We've uh, we're looking at other states and how they've done it. Um, so, but we're very aware of that. Okay. But yeah, good question. Yes, sir. What did you, 
I'm sorry, did you say that the money from those applications are going to go into the program? Where's that money going to go? Okay, it goes to fund, the, number one, it goes to fund the program. We've got, we've worked on a budget. It's going to probably cost somewhere between five and six million dollars a year just to run this program in the state of Missouri. That's all the staffing for the 50 employees, all the software, all the equipment, you know, the people in the field, the whole thing. It'll be about a five to six million dollar program. The fees for the licenses, facilities, and even for the cards that we're issuing, though, that will go to help fund this program. Now, there will also be a sales tax on the product, just like there's a sales tax on anything else. In my town, it's 8.125. I don't know what it is here, but and so your local, your local uh, city and county get a portion of that, and the state gets a portion of that. Just general sales, right? regular sales tax. In addition to that, the amendment also put a 4% tax on the product for that goes straight to the veterans. And that was part of the amendment. So basically it'd be about a 12% sales tax on the on the on the dispense product. And uh, so but the fees will all go to fund the program, the department. If there's any money left after all the programs paid for out of those fees, it'll go to the veterans. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Mark's the <clears throat> Yeah, so we, we get involved in this too. Yeah. Um, the fees are directly go, all go directly to uh, to their department. Um, like any other sales tax, all the sales tax money will come to revenue, so it will be separated. It will be really easy to figure out. Uh, what goes where, and I think you described it well. Your normal sales tax is charged, and will go to the place that your normal sales tax goes. And then on top of that's another four percent for the veterans commission. Right, well, it goes to a veterans fund. Okay, sir. Your name again? Lindell L Y N D A L L. Fraker. 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 And what? How much did you pay? And millions that come in for those applications. So far, right now, we're 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 over three million four hundred thousand. Yeah, that's non refundable. Okay, I think gentleman back here. Yeah, sure. I, I, I have a question. Yeah, we'll we'll okay. catch we'll okay. catch you both there. <laughs> My question was, you, you were stating the minimum number. Uh huh. Will Will there be more than that minimum possibly? It's possible. It is possible. the The amendment was pretty clear. The way it's the way it we have to follow this amendment because that's in our constitution now. And it says if these numbers don't meet the demands of the citizens of Missouri, then we can issue more licenses. So the first round, which will be in August, we plan on sticking fairly close to those numbers. Um, then. We will see as time goes whether that's going to provide the need for the for the US citizens and possibly do another round or whatever. Yes, sir. Okay. Based on what you're saying, uh, no people that got their application in earlier got 400 or so. Based on the court system, uh, they don't have any preference for the That's right. No advantage, none at all. And then the second uh -huh. would be the outside parking you have to have with the experience. After a certain duration of my gaining experience, can I drop them or I got to have them? That, that would be up to you. I mean, there will be uh, uh, some some are going to be able to, the ownership could be 100% Missouri, but they're just going to hire managers that have worked in the industry. That would that would obviously qualify as experience, too. So uh, we're not going to get into the business end. But that's, that's just one of those, I think there's 10 categories that were in the amendment that we have to look at to help break down the scoring system. And that was just one of them, the experience in the, in the industry. So, yes, sir. Are there certain forms you need to take to your doctor to get them done? Yes. Those will be available after June the 4th. After June the 4th. And they'll be available on our website, the website that I called out there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, to the deck and eye and appearance. Uh, not, not specifically. In other words, uh, if you went to a state that had both, then uh, I think 
you could be certified by your doctor for any of those products. Uh, I don't know of any restrictions that the doctor would put on that on that for you. Um, so in, in general, no. Now, we will do some things to restrict packaging, um, making sure that edible products don't look like children's candy, things like that. We'll have some of those things in the regulation portion. But uh, it's my understanding, and I'm not an expert on the product, but if a doctor prescribes, or doesn't, we can't use the word prescription there, it certifies you to be able to have medical marijuana, then uh, uh, they can suggest that you get an edible product or a, uh, another type of product. So there's really not a difference there. Yes? It, I, I, I don't know yet. I'm not sure. We haven't got that piece developed yet. We haven't got those rules rough drafted, so I don't have the answers on that. All I know is the amendment says we have to develop one, and it's we're trying to make sure that we do that the best of our ability and look at all of the very specific uh, things on that. Yes? Yes? Let me read it to you. I don't want to tell you wrong. The qualifying medical condition means the condition of the symptoms related to or side effects from the treatment of cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, intractable migraines unresponsive to other treatment, a chronic medical condition that causes severe persistent pain or persistent muscle spasms, including but not limited to those associated with multiple sclerosis, seizures, Parkinson's disease, and Tourette's syndrome. Debilitating psychiatric disorders including, but not limited to, post-traumatic stress disorder, if diagnosed by a state licensed psychiatrist. Human in, immune, immunodeficiency virus or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. A chronic medical condition that is normally treated with a prescription medication that could lead to physical or psychological dependence when a physician determines that medical use of marijuana could be effective in treating that condition and would serve as a safer alternative to the prescription medication. So that's all. And then any terminal illness or the last one. In the professional judgment of a physician, any chronic, debilitating, or other medical condition, including but not limited to hepatitis C, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, Huntington's disease, autism, neuropathies, sickle cell anemia, agitation of Alzheimer's disease, C A C H E X I A. Okay. And wasting symptoms. So, those are the categories listed in the amendment. As you can tell, there's a couple in there that's pretty much up to the doctor. Uh huh. Is there going to be standardized pricing for the product? Yeah. We will not regulate pricing, uh, we will not get into that end of it at all. Yes. We are looking at we are looking at those options. Yes. You, so this has nothing to do with insurance. Nothing to do with insurance. Insurance would not cover. Yes. Yes. Are doctors required to write the prescription? No. There would be no restrictions or no uh, demand by us with the doctors. There. This is a this is a medical situation, just like doctors would have with anything else. Yes, sir. Could you describe where the funding for the veterans is going to specifically? Has that been the, no, the, the amendment says that a special fund will be set up through the Missouri Treasurer's Office, and they will be the guardian of the fund. 
we will not control how they spend that. I think the Veterans Commission, I believe, are the ones that will be able to determine that, working with the Treasurer's Office. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. You said something about insurance will not cover this. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's not a prescription. It's a certification that the, the, your doctor says this might help you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry. I'm a little off the path, but uh -huh. uh, I'm a national sales manager for a security company, and obviously they have rules. Mm -hmm. We've handled a lot of them for what they have to have there. Have you given any consideration to the neighborhoods around those? Are those addresses listable where people are going to be going to them and that? people around an area that the crime could go up that they are going to get some type of uh, incentive to get alarmed. Go ahead, speak up there if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah speak up where they can. I want to know where you have facts where the crime went up where dispensaries are because I can show you numbers where that's the opposite of the case. I'm sorry, but I think I was speaking to one person. And okay. I the right to ask a question. Okay, I didn't hear what he said. Okay. He's asking okay. me how I know crime yeah. goes up. Okay. okay. Well, we, uh, I don't have any information about who's applied, where they've applied. I don't have that information available. Um, the pre the pre application fees were also, those forms, when they sent those in, those addresses and that information was all subject to change also. So in other words, back in January, they've been sending in fees. They, they put a, a tentative date or a tentative location of where they may want to locate a facility, but that doesn't bind them. The application they send it in August will. It'll be a more elaborate application. So, uh, but we will not give any incentives uh, or anything like that. It, our scoring system will be a blind scoring system. We won't, the people that score it won't know who the names are. It'll be based on their application, which may be hundreds of pages long uh, because of the categories. And I, I can read you those categories, or at least just so everybody kind of knows what, what the amendment called out on that. This, this isn't what we made up. This is what the voters voted on. There's 10 categories, and the first one, is the character, veracity, background, qualifications, and relevant experience of principal officers or managers. Number two, the business plan proposed by the applicant, which in the case of cultivation facilities and dispensaries, shall include the ability to maintain an adequate supply of marijuana, plans to ensure safety and security of qualifying patients and, and the community, and procedures to be used to prevent diversion and any plan for making marijuana available to low-income qualifying patients. Number three, site security. Number four, experience in a legal cannabis market. Number five, in the case of medical marijuana testing facilities, the experience of their personnel with testing marijuana, food or drugs, or toxins, and or the potency and the healthcare industry experience. Number six, the potential for positive economic impact in the site community. Number seven, in the case of medical marijuana cultivation facilities, the capacity or experience with agriculture, horticulture, and healthcare. Number eight, in the case of medical marijuana dispensary facilities, the capacity or experience with health care, the suitability of the proposed location, and its accessibility for patients. Number nine, in the case of medical marijuana infused products manufacturing facilities, the capacity or experience with food and beverage manufacturing, and number 10, maintaining competitive, competitiveness in the marijuana for medical use marketplace. So, in ranking all the applicants and awarding licenses and certificates, the department may consult or contract with other public agencies with relevant expertise regarding these factors. And the department shall lift or ease any limit on the number of licenses or certificate holders in order to meet the demand for medical use by qualifying patients. So that's the portion where we may be able to issue more licenses if we see the need. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes. I'm, uh the reason why I'm asking this question, I'm Rashonda to Orbs, I'm running for Raytown School Board. Uh -huh. So my question is, will the dispensaries have to be so far away from schools, or is there a distance? They and will. Playground. They will. Okay. Uh, it's a thousand feet. That's in the amendment. A thousand feet? A thousand feet from schools, uh, daycares or preschools, and churches. And what about okay. playgrounds? Playgrounds. playgrounds would be part of the school facility. Yes, sir. You know, to address that, I, I think that if this is a business, 
it should be zoned as a business. So I don't think it will be around to play around anyway. But to address this gentleman's concern about security, anytime there's money involved, and it will probably be quite a bit of money, that should be a concern. And I, I don't know what numbers you think you might have, but whenever there's money involved, there should be security. Yeah. Security is going to be a big portion, as you can tell. It was a whole category by itself, the site security in the scoring system. So it's going to be something that's going to be very important. Yes. Yes. about internally since Amendment 2 passed. Um, you're right, um, uh, this is a heavily um, cash business, um, and that means that they may pay their, ta their taxes in cash. Um, we're not set up for that right now, so it's something we're definitely planning for. Um, like um, uh, the Department of Health, um, we're looking at the examples from other states um, to see how other states are handling it. Um, but it is, it's still in the planning stages. I mean, I don't think anybody expects that, that any of these dispensaries will open up before the end of the year. So we have some time to um, to take, take a look at it and, and to plan. I will say that, um, that you're absolutely right that FDIC banks um, will not open accounts for these companies uh, because of federal law. Um, but credit unions in other states are starting to because they're not FDIC. And so we're kind of hoping between now and the end of the year that credit unions step up and that will solve a lot of our problems. Yes, sir. Do the growth or do the dispensaries are they allowed to grow the product on site or is that separate? No, that would be separate. Mm -hmm. That'd be the cultivation facility. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Is in the law enforcement portion of this, uh, is that going to be local or is that going to be state or how are they going to keep track of the homegrown uh, feature and also driving when you're stoned? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Your, your, your regular law enforcement, uh, we're, we're in constant communication with them and we're working out some details of how to help them do their job and it will be, we will not be, we'll have compliance officers that will be following up on the rules and regulations, but they won't have arrest power. They'll be working with the local sheriff's departments, police chiefs, and highway patrol, and they've all been very willing and, and very good to help us at this point. Uh, they understand this is going to be, it's going to impact their agencies as much, if not any more, than anyone else's. So uh, we're, we're, we're working through that with them. But um, they, they've, they've got some plans and ideas on how they're going to deal with you know anything under the influence of any kind of a drug or alcohol. That's still illegal. And so that, that won't be an excuse. So be, they're working on those. Yes? If somebody does have certification in, say, Missouri, and they vacation, the amendment does not does not include reciprocity that's the word that we it took me a while to, to say that word <laughs> uh, it does not include that so uh, we are so still working on rules okay. but but the amendment is did not include it so I I don't have a definite answer for you, but um, if they would have spelled that out in the amendment, it would have made it easier for us. Let's put it that way. But it's because, again, because of the federal law, we can't cross state lines, and so it's an issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're saying use another state's car. Yes. Yes. I don't have it. I don't have a, an answer for that today. Yes, sir. Basically, states like your Missouri card will be valid in Nevada. They accept it. Uh, Arizona, no. Every state still has different rules and regulations of whether they'll accept an out-of-state card or not. Oklahoma will. Arkansas, no. But the question on whether we would accept their state cards, I can't answer yet. It, 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 it was not in the amendment. Yes? It doesn't state lines. anybody ever 
Well, it's been a great evening. I appreciate you. <laughs> I did that in one of my other forum, one of my other forums, and it went over pretty well. So I'm, I'm, I'm using it regularly now. Actually, that that's something that uh, I don't have an answer for. And uh, just just follow up, check with the rules. We're we're gonna we're gonna address that somewhere or another. The stork, I think, brings them in. So, yes. We'll do that. I'm sorry. We should have done that. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the current estimated uh, annual sales? Uh, His question, what, what's our estimated annual sales for Missouri? I think some of the initial numbers that we've been told is probably at $500 million in the first year or so, year or two. They think that this will be a billion-dollar industry in Missouri. Yes. If the program is supposed to be funded with fees, uh huh. Well, we can we can draw from the four percent that goes to the veterans. The way the amendments drafted, that we can use um, a percentage of that to help fund the program. I don't exactly remember what it is, but it is in the amendments. So we, we don't anticipate uh, spending probably more than the fees the way it's set up. Yes? But don't I understand that it is heavily, heavily taxed industry, although the people operating are not able to write it off or write off any, any, have any tax deductions for owning and operating the businesses? I'm going to let Mark... Mark He's the tax guy, so he's the expert there. Right? Uh, we mentioned before, so there's, there is the normal sales tax. Um, so you're in rate kind of depending on where you live, because if you're in a different district or not, uh, it may be anywhere between 8 and 9 percent normal tax. Um, and then there's a 4 percent tax on top of that, that's opposed to the Veterans Fund. Uh, so it's a total 12 percent tax on this. Um, there are no tax deductions that I am aware of. Um, I have heard some talk in the General Assembly about trying to do something, but I haven't seen any bills moving uh, to give a tax deduction for so that. So like your C&Ts that you pay for alcohol, you're not going to enforce some sort of a C&T tax on medical marijuana? There's no, there is no authorized excise tax, like for cigarettes or alcohol, um, for medical marijuana. There, there's no tax authorized. If there's not a tax authorized, we can't tax it. The local governments can't do it either. So, you're, it's really clear in the amendment that the drafters they wanted to make sure that local governments could not could not say no. In other words, if, if no additional permit other than a normal building permit or a business permit, merchant's license or something like that, they can certainly do that. But nothing above and beyond that. But is it your understanding that the federal government can tax you? No. The federal government doesn't have sales taxes. They can tax the profit. They can tax the profit. Yeah, yeah, like any business, you are going to have a, you're going to have a, a corporate or personal income tax, depending on how the business is owned. But it's not at a higher rate. It's going to be operating income tax, just like any other business would operate under. Well, one thing that you may have heard, some states have a very high sales tax on marijuana products. I think Oregon has like 38% or something. That's oh, that's rec on the recreational side, okay. So, but Missouri doesn't have that on, on this at all. So that's 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 a good question because a lot of people, you know, have heard that from other states. Well, I know we've got another group that want to speak. I'll take the last two here, then we'll move on because we need to get them. Yeah. Is, is there any uh, For the individuals? No, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any repercussion by the federal government if you're on a list that you're taking medical marijuana or you have a card? No, there's not. Um, back in 2014, there was a federal congressional act called the Rohrabacher Farm Act. 
and that was done through their budget, through their appropriations. And it basically said any state that passes any kind of a marijuana program in the states, then the federal government were not was not going to spend any money on fighting marijuana in those states federally. That was kind of the first move the federal government made toward relaxing the, the, the criminality of marijuana because it kind of gets back to that states versus federal rights. And they felt like the states were making these decisions and they needed to leave them alone. Is that a good way to summarize that, Mark? Um, so there's not, not, a, not an issue with that. Yes, ma'am, this will be the last question. My final question was regarding wherever these Can the cities put any further restrictions on allowing facilities in their communities? No, they cannot. The amendment is very clear about that. Now, they can loosen that 1,000 foot rule. That's in the amendment. If the city of Raytown says, we're going to allow a facility 300 feet from this school playground, they can do that in the cities. But they can't go further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Just to add a little taste, uh, Raytown is waiting on the state of Missouri to develop the rules before they uh, put their amendments and rules into uh, play. So it may be a little further down the road. But uh, And during their uh, debate on their rules, I'm quite sure you will have some input at the city council meeting to do that. Yes. Wouldn't they be required to be ready when the program is up and running? Well, once the state finished theirs yeah, off, June 4th we'll have the rules done. June 4th, he said the rules be done, and we probably have our done somewhere right around, right around there. Uh, 